so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all of the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. That is why we're here, Lord, to share your love with one another and to praise you with our hearts. May your love grow more and more in each one of us. And we praise you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I am just so uh, wonderfully at peace here as we come into this time that really does define who we are as a community of believers. Our opening worship is called Christ Alone. Christ 
Christ alone, my hope is found. Here is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, burn through the fiercest round and storm. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless faith, the gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. There in the crowd His body lay By the world I died to slay In bursting cold In glorious day Up from the grave He rose again As I lay down In victory His curse is lost It's been for me No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of Declare it over us here at Claremont Christian Fellowship, but over all those who tune in and all who call on your name this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Come on. Good morning, church. Good morning, children. And I'll tell you, it's so great to see people sitting in the pews, and I can look out and see faces. It's really wonderful, and I thank God for bringing us back. What a gracious God we have. But today, I'd like to use the word thankful. Now, I know you've all heard it. You've heard it said a lot of times. But I have a definition that God said about the word thankful. The word thankful is God's spiritual medicine to you to protect your heart. So what does God mean by that? Let's go back a year to when the COVID virus first was apparent in our lives. One week, all of a sudden, school was closed. You were told not to come back. The parks were closed, the beaches were closed, the libraries were closed. What did you feel at that time? Maybe afraid? Maybe concerned, discouraged? You couldn't see your friends? Where do you go with those feelings? They're real. They're real to you. They're very real, and God knows that. We have to go somewhere, so we have to go to God with a thankful heart. And I want to share with you what happened with us, I know. 
They all of a sudden had senior lines to go into the grocery store. So at six o'clock in the morning, my husband and I, we'd get in line, we'd be waiting, freezing outside, only to get into the store and find out that all the Clorox wipes were gone and the toilet paper was gone. So you ask a clerk, where are all these things? When are they gonna come around? They didn't know. And you know, that was the first time in my life I'd gone into a grocery store and did not find these items on the shelf. And frankly, I started to get a little concerned here. God, what happens if all this stuff runs out? I'm a little afraid. I am, I'm concerned and I'm afraid. What do I do? Nothing was changing. I had to change. I had to change what I thought in my mind so it would get down in my heart because I don't want to hang on to fear. I don't want to hang on to I'm mad because those things, if they stay in your heart, they get worse. So as a child, what do you do? You say, first of all, God, I'm thankful that I'm here. And remember one thing, Jesus did not go on lockdown. He was outside. He was watching us. He was taking care of us, and he still is. So he's always there, and we can remember that. So when we get into those fearful places, we have to train ourselves, and it doesn't happen overnight, to be thankful for something. Thankful that you're in your house. Thankful that the schools were protecting you. Thankful that they were looking for a virus shot to take care of you. And there was a song we used to think, sing, think. <laughs> I'm thinking of thinking. And it was called, um, Be Thankful. Be thankful with a gracious heart. Be thankful for the Lord, for he is Jesus Christ. And let's be thankful for Christ today, because no matter what the situation, what the feelings, he has never left us, he's never forsaken us, his eye is always on you. So thank you today for Jesus. We thank you and we pray for all the children, all of you. We thankful that we're here. We thankful for this body of Christ, for our parents and for our teachers. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you, Diana. That was great. That was great. Good morning. Well, here we are again. It is so good to see you. It is so good to see people, see faces. Okay, we have the bulletin here. This is our time for announcements. And there are a lot. There always are a lot of them. That goes to show that we still keep on keeping on, don't we? So this is the third Sunday of Lent. So those of you who are at home, be sure that you get your uh, communion elements ready because we will be taking communion uh, later on this morning. Um, uh, we have the altars decorated to the glory of our Lord. Always, always. Um, we have uh, lots of things. Uh, next week is going to be a very busy week because we have Daylight Saving Times comes back. So be sure that you spring ahead on your clock so you're here on time. Um, and uh, do that Saturday night, which I usually do. We have a new flower chart uh, in the back, in the narthex, and uh, you can uh, call, uh, come by, or sign up as you go out uh, if you want to honor someone uh, with flowers. Uh, special occasions uh, have lots of dates that are open, so check that out. Um, if you don't feel uh, comfortable coming in uh, to the church, you can always call the office during the week and set up something with uh, Sharon or Diana. Uh, we have healing rooms. They are open uh, in person now on Thursday evenings from 5 until 6.30. So you can avail yourself of, of, of getting personal prayer. Um, God does work through those things. Um, you can email them. Uh, they, they also have the, the Zoom prayer too. So check, check out these things in the bulletin and their bulletins are even online. Um, next, uh, on the 13th, next Saturday, we will be having a, our all-church prayer meeting, so be sure to come out for that. Um, it's a powerful time. It's the time God calls us to come together as a church and, and pray for the church and pray for other things, our government, um, 
all kinds of things. So give it a, give it a try because it's a, it's a good time. The healing service will also be uh, next uh, Sunday evening, March 14th at 6 p.m. Uh, we have a very special speaker this time, our very own Mark Flores here. So come, come and hear what he has to say because he's done this before and it's a very powerful testimony. Um, we have all kinds of, of things in the bulletin here. Uh, we do have the women's uh, Bible study uh, Tuesday afternoons at 1 p.m. We are meeting back in uh, the fellowship hall over here. So come for that. Uh, it's a great time. We are going over Riley's questions, which I will show you too, because these are great. These come out in the bulletin. You get them online as well. Uh, we're doing, um, there's lots of questions in here and they are good. So avail yourself of, of Tuesday afternoon or uh, the men I believe are doing these on Tuesday evening, I believe. And also um, some of the, uh, uh, we have a Friday night Zoom that um, a few of us are doing, so join us for those things. And last but not least, uh, we want to do the offering. So let's, let's pray for the offering. Lord God, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be here. We lift these... Um, gifts that you have given us, we just return a small portion of that. That's all you want is a small portion of back of all that you give us. You, you are extravagant in your giving, Lord God. So take these gifts, these offerings that we offer uh, back to you, and we say thank you and thank you for blessing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you. If I could just have a few seconds here. Uh, Sharon in the office was asking me for the title of my message and it was a very difficult thing to condense down into a few words because I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you to join me on this Sunday healing service because I'm going to be opening the scripture and using a slightly different lens to look at some very familiar scriptures and I'm inviting you to just come and get into this distorted mind <laughs> that God gave me but honestly, no, it's going to be something I'm very excited about. It's a, a doorway that I hope brings a different and fresh perspective to some stories that we all heard. And uh, especially for people, if you know someone in your life who sort of doubts that the God that we worship really even has the capacity to be interested in us one-on-one. -on -one, and that's the thing that I want to bring to the floor that evening is that God does know us one on one and I'm going to show you some scriptures that really testify to that so please join me looking forward to that time of healing and grace we're entering into our time of worship we're opening up with a song that calls it's called the lion and the lamb this song is inspired by well not you can't really say that it's the Holy Spirit but if you look in the book of Revelations chapter 5 and as the, the seals and the scrolls are begin to open uh they say, the, the, the one, the narrator saying, who is worthy? Revelation 5.5 5 says the line of Judah, the line from the tribe of Judah. And that's, of course, our Lord and Savior, which is the, it's just an amazing ending to all of the thousands of years of prophecy come true in that one area of the book of Revelation. And it's a beautiful thing. The lion and the lamb. He's coming on the clouds. The kings and kingdoms will bow down. Sins of the world, his blood is a 
Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. But who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee we bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee we bow before him. Who can stop the Lord?
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Savior died. 
consider what it means that you died for us. So Lord, we ask that you, even now, speak to each one of us about where we need to say no to ourselves. As we heard last week, take up our cross. That meant let we let go of our own self-interest for the sake of your will in our lives. You call us to be filled with your love. You will heal us. You will renew us. You will take away the sin. You will just make us completely new, but not just for us, but for others. So we ask that you do that in this day. And Lord, as we pray, we think about those who are in our hearts, in our families, in our lives, in our community, in our world, that need your touch. Lord, we ask that even as we are before you in our thoughts together, that you would hear each of our thoughts as we name those in our lives who struggle with the issues of health, both recovery 
and facing new diagnosis and struggling in the midst and persevering and not giving up, Lord, we ask that you be with each one. Thank you that they are not alone and thank you that they are in our hearts and that you and they and us are all together. Lord, we ask you build that unity even as we pray for one another throughout the week. Lord, we also think about circumstances of life, places where relationships are strained or broken or alienated. Lord, we ask that you would show us how to persevere in that waiting, persevere in that longing as we look out, almost like you did with the prodigal son, as we look out wishing that there could be restoration in relationships that break our heart. Lord, we ask that you hold near and dear those that we can't communicate with right now. And you make a way for us to have restoration in our day. Lord, we look at our world, we see the conflict, we see the disease still, we see the poverty, we see the injustice. And Lord, we say, how long? How long, Lord? How long will it be this way? You tell us to trust you, and so we do. And you tell us to walk in justice, so we will. You tell us to love mercy, walk humbly, and give ourselves in that love to others, so we will. And we trust you, Lord. We trust you. We are yours. Everything about us, Lord, is yours. To use and command. We ask that you teach us what that means even more today. As we pray as your children, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And we're still going to hear it some. I forgot that on the first Sunday, we have our musicians sing this for us. Redeemed you, 
I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you, and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together, and the peoples assemble. Which of them foretold this, foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their, to their, in their witnesses to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say, It is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I, not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? Second reading is from Mark, chapter 9, 2 through 29. Begins with the Transfiguration, chapter 2, verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transformed, fit transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, Why do you teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Man must suffer much and be rejected, but I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. When they came to the other disciple, they, to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing about? Of arguing with them about? He asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. 
Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word and to our understanding. Amen. Thank you, Carol. It's good to see you all in the room. What a joy. Shout out to those in the patio. Thank you for being here. Good to see you too. We actually have both opportunities because some people need the outdoor um, extra precaution, even from a work perspective. I think one of them out there. So good to have you guys out there. Good to have you guys here and good to see you folks at home. So have you ever had what they call a mountaintop experience that just takes you to this soaring height of joy, of even a transcendent understanding of things. Maybe it's been on a retreat. Maybe it's been something more intimate or personal. And then you come down the mountain and have to deal with real life. That's our story today. We talk about that. We talk about going and seeing from the mountaintop and knowing. There's a different knowing on the mountaintop. It's not still Black History Month, but I think about Martin Luther King and saying, I have been to the mountaintop. He could see what was coming. And I love the next phrase. I may not go there with you, but he's seen what's coming. And we know what happened to him. He lost his life, but he declared the truth of what he knew was coming and trusted in that. We are disciples of the Most High who have seen what's coming. And we trust in that, even when we come down the mountain and have to deal with everything else that's around us. A story about this. So, this isn't a grandkid's story, it's a child story. So, Mike, wherever you are, rest in peace. You're not going to hear about from my grandkids for once. Although I could show you, but never mind. <laughs> um, when we were pregnant with Joyce. That's our daughter. Now, my wife and I didn't start kids until we were a little older. And the doctors were saying, oh, well, you're an older mother. We need to do this test. And, you know, we need to know what's going to happen if, uh, you, know, be, you know, you just never know. Can't remember what it was. But we said, well, if you find something, what do you do? Well, you may not want to keep the child. We said, well, that's not an option. So we said no to the test. They were saying, are you sure you should have that? I think it's the one where they go into the, the spinal cord and pull out fluid and then do the genetic testing and things. Just no, we're not doing that. But we let them talk us into the idea of doing uh, what they call the deep sonogram. And we were there probably about 18 weeks, maybe a little less. But we could see Joyce see the face. We knew that she was a girl. And we just, oh, I can remember leaving that place thinking, oh my Lord, I've just met this young one and we hadn't figured out names yet, but we piled them all on. We, that's a different story. But I can remember driving home and just being in sheer joy and delight at seeing this child and knowing the promise of what was coming and just praising God. And then Trish started into preterm labor. 
we actually were pretty, I mean, they thought Joyce was coming then in 15, 16, 17 weeks. And they did everything to say, no, stay there. And from the high of, oh, what a joy, to the low of, oh my goodness, we may lose her, was such a contrast. How can this be, Lord? You've just introduced me to this child of mine that I already love, already have opened my heart to, and you're going to take her away. It was an agonizing period. Trish was on officially on bed rest from then on. And when we got to the weekend that Joyce was born, that Friday before she was born on Sunday, the doctor at the exam said, I didn't give this child a 50% chance of making it. I knew what this father in our story felt. Oh God, this child, he, he is as good as dead in this condition. And I asked your disciples and they couldn't do anything. Only you can do it. Lord, help us. I knew that desperate prayer. Our story is about these contrasts. Normally this message of transfiguration is the last Sunday before Lent. But we're looking at it as we see Jesus teaching his disciples about Good Friday and the cross and how that has to happen before the Messiah reigns in glory. Last week we talked about the first prediction Jesus made about his death. If you remember, he had asked the disciples, well, who do people say I am? And they said, well, some think you're a prophet, some think you're a teacher, I mean, if you're Moses or Elijah. Okay, who do you say I am? The disciples, Peter being the spokesperson, said you're the son of God. Jesus says to him, you, you can't know this except by the Holy Spirit, but it's the right answer. And that's confirmation and excitement. They're expecting the Messiah to come and set all things right. We've talked about that. They expect the Messiah to usher in an earthly kingdom, reestablish a true son of David on the throne, drive out all the oppressors, defeat every army that comes, and stand in truth with the people of God, the nation of Israel, being redeemed. You know, they haven't had their own real country for centuries. They've been puppets all along. How long, O oh Lord? Well, here he is, and he's going to set all things right. Right? No. He said, the Son of Man must suffer and die, be treated shamefully by the religious leaders. Peter says, Lord, that can't be. Peter literally wants to tell, tell the Almighty, your plan doesn't work for me. I want it to be different. You can't do this. That's not what the Messiah means. Echoing his encounter with Satan at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus says to his friend, get behind me, Satan. He goes on to say that you will see power come from on high. And then we walk in, six days later, we walk into our story this morning. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, and goes up to a high mountain. Ask yourself this, why are they going up the mountain? Mountains have been significant for millennia. Moses went up the mountain. When he came down from the mountain, his face glowed because of his encounter with the presence of God. He brought the law. He was the first prophet of the nation. Elijah, when he was hiding from Jezebel and Ahab, runs and goes back to that mountain, encounters the Lord, hears that still small voice, and is in both encouraged and disciplined, if you were, 
Don't stay here. You've got work to do. Go. Jesus goes to the mountain with his friends. These are the closer inner circle. They are the ones that go with him into the garden and pray with him. They're part of the twelve, but they're sort of leaders within the twelve. They go to the mountain, and all of a sudden, they see something they have never seen before. We call it the transfiguration. Jesus is there, but he's suddenly turned to full, bright, white, lightning level brightness. And there's Moses and Elijah with him. Cloud comes down. That cloud has always symbolized God's presence. When the people were in the wilderness, the cloud went before them by day and fire by night. When Moses went to the mountain, the cloud came down. When God filled the tabernacle, the cloud came. The cloud comes, covers Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, and you hear the voice of the Father. This is my son who I love. They are petrified. They are overwhelmed. It says they're afraid. They don't know what to say. Peter says, well, why don't we build some tents and booths? Obviously, this is the beginning of the kingdom. Look at what's happening. This is miraculous. Let's capture this. Let's, let's, let's set up a monument. Oh, you guys need a place to stay. It's exactly what we do with the mountaintops. We want to hold on to it. We want to claim it. We want to define it. We want to force it into our everyday the way we want it to be. It's not the way it's going to be. Not yet. They're walking down the mountain. The disciples are asking Jesus, well, okay, so we know that Elijah is coming first. You know, if you, if you haven't paid attention to the geography of your Bible, what's the very last paragraph of the Old Testament. So, as the disciples were sitting there talking with Jesus coming down the mountain, they didn't have the New Testament yet. The scriptures ended with Malachi. The very last paragraph in Malachi says, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children, the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Can you imagine that being how you live your faith in God, being the final word? That dreadful day? So the disciples are here. They expect, like every other good Jew, that Elijah's going to come turn things right, but it'll be a terrible day. There's different reasons for that. It'll be a day of redemption. The Lord will make things right, but he will exercise judgment where things are wrong. I will come and strike the land with total destruction if people aren't listening correctly, if they're not behaving. If you look at the prophets, we've heard over and over and over and over and over again how the nation has been led astray, has fallen away, has gone their own way. Even the passage this morning from Isaiah, it sounds hopeful, and it is, but it comes on the heels of the Lord reminding the people that they have not been listening, and they have been doing it their own way. Which of you will listen to this and pay close attention to the time that comes. The very last part of chapter 42, the prophet, speaking for the Lord, says, He poured out on them his burning anger, the violence of war. It enveloped them in flames, yet they did not understand. It consumed them, but they did not take it to heart. There are so many times when if we listen to our own mind and we listen to the truth, we realize that not only with the nation of Israel, not only with the nation of the United States, not only with the Church of Claremont Christian Fellowship, not only with the citizens of this earth, we still 
do not yield to the Almighty, we still have chosen to go our own way. The final word right before our passage in Isaiah is this message that God is going to come and execute judgment and be ready. It's a terrible day, but a king will rise. That's what the disciples think. That's why Peter says, you can't suffer and die. Messiah can't do that. They're focusing on what they want to see happen. They're focusing on their fatigue with the way things have been for generations. The Romans now, the Babylonians, the Persians, whoever, they've been overrun for generations. Lord, we want our own nation. We want our own way. We want our family to go the way we want it. We know you love us. We want it, Lord, now. Peter, like us, like the early disciples, need to remember there's another voice. In Isaiah, our passage that picks up right after, it enveloped them in flames, but they did not understand. It consumed them, but they did not take it to heart as the prophets talking about the people going into exile, having been in exile for a couple generations, and now they're coming He's prophesizing to the folks that are going to come out of exile and into a restored Israel. But even after they've suffered all that corrective discipline, they still are not listening. They still are not understanding. You'd expect the next phrase to be more about God exercising judgment. But we hear this. This is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who formed you, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. Who? I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'm going to be with you. When, you. when the floods sweep over you, they will not harm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. I will give others as ransom for you as I bring you back to myself. I will call your children from the east. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give up my children. Give, don't hold them back. Leave those that are blind, even those that are lame. Bring them. He says, which of the other gods can say what I've said? Who can do what I've determined to accomplish? I am the Lord. A little bit after our reading, he says, This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, recalling the escape from Egypt. It's like coming back from Babylon, and even as they look forward to the coming of the Messiah, it's a new exodus. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and the horses and the army, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out. Uh, to forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? He is telling the people centuries before Jesus said, okay, Lord, the century idea, this waiting stuff, sometimes we just can't handle it. Oh, never mind. Sorry. The centuries before Jesus, he's telling them what he's going to do. He is going to make a way. It's not going to be based on their ability. We've heard that over and over and over again. We fall down. They fell down. Even the disciples who were with them, with Jesus, for those three years, they fall down. They don't fully understand. Peter, James, and John see the glory on the mountain. They see the Lord transfigured. And now they're walking down the mountain. Well, what is this about Elijah again? Jesus knows this conversation is coming. 
So my suggestion about emotion is purely human speculation. But he does say how long are you not going to understand a little bit later. But you just, if he were us, we'd be saying, okay, I've been talking to you about this for how long and you still don't get it? Dare I say, I've probably heard that message myself. I've been talking to you for so long, Riley, and you still don't get it? Elijah does come first. In fact, Elijah has already come. And they mistreated him. And he's referring to John the Baptist, who has already been beheaded in a very parallel way to Elijah being persecuted by Ahab and Jezebel, Herod and Herodias, his brother's unlawfully wed wife to him. You know, you know the story about how John ends up being beheaded. Jesus says he was Elijah, the one to come to prepare the way. When he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, that was preparing the way. Okay. They still don't get it. They rejoin, okay, this is the full on, from the mountaintop down into the valley, they get to where the other disciples are, and they walk right into an argument, a political, theological debate over how to heal a boy. So, we don't know how it gets started, but what Jesus and the, and the three C's, they walk up to the rest of them, is a crowd, the scribes, the rulers, the, the teachers of the law, and the other disciples arguing. I don't even know if you would have noticed the child and the father still who were the center of the debate. We hear about this in a second. Here's this man I know what he feels like, who is so desperate he has no other recourse. He comes to the disciples of the teacher, Jesus, because rumor has had it and other people have testified that, that healing can happen and miracles happen where this guy goes. And I brought my child to the disciples and they couldn't do anything. And as a matter of fact, all they're doing now is arguing with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law about, we don't know, but they could be arguing about how healing is supposed to happen, or whether or not this child has sin that needs to be forgiven, or whether the father, I mean, there's all kinds of speculation. We just don't know. It's the father who comes to Jesus and explains. My child has this demon. He can't speak. He barely understands anything. And I have to pay attention to him 24-7 because at any minute the demon will throw him into the fire or throw him into the water and he'll convulse and it's like he's dead. And I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. Jesus speaks to the boy. Well, let me get this one point in. Before he speaks to the boy, he's talked to the disciples, and uh, here's this report, and he says, you unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they bring him the boy, and when the spirit sees that it's Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asks the father, how long has he been like this from childhood? He's, he'll throw him into the fire to try to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us, the father says. Jesus responds, if I can, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaims, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. We often hear that exchange as judgment. But if you look at the story, this man is the one who prayed. 
At the end, Jesus says, this is the kind that can only come out by prayer. The disciples and the teachers of the law have been arguing over theology in the presence of a child who needs healing. It's the Father who prays. Lord, help my unbelief. I do believe, but help my unbelief. There is the position of faith that Jesus is asking for. He wants us to know that no matter how desperate the situation, He is the source of our hope. He is the source of fulfillment. He is the source of healing. He is the source of restoration. It's not in our convincing arguments. It's not even in right understanding. It's total dependence on Him. Jesus says everything is possible for one who believes. We can see from this passage that Jesus actually expected his disciples to be able to take care of this. After all, early on, before he had even begun the years of in-service, he sends them out and they do heal and they do see demons and Jesus says, demons leave, and Jesus says, I saw Satan falling from the sky as you went out two by two and did this work. And they were amazed. They were. And it worked. Jesus expects his disciples, he expects us to walk in this same truth. The truth of carrying his presence in us and with us and to go boldly wherever we need to go. This week I saw a story, and this the theme of this is that heaven is breaking in wherever we are if we will let ourselves be connected to that truth. If we will hold on to the truth of the mountain and then let it permeate us as we deal with the valley. This young man, about 15 or 16 when it happened, named Jamie, was walking home from school. Actually, he was walking to a store to get a Gatorade. And he's crossing a bridge in his hometown. And he sees a man standing on the edge of the bridge. Is he just looking at the view? He's not sure, but he feels an alarm go off inside. Again, this is a 15 year old, 16 year old. And he goes up to the man and says, are you okay? They pr proceed to have a 45 minute conversation about Not giving up. What's going on? What are you thinking? 15 year old, 16 year old talking to an adult. Jamie wants to call for an ambulance. The man says, no, 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 don't. That's probably part of what the conversation was because he says, I have to go. I can't stay any longer. Convinces the man to come off the ledge. They sit down, they finish their conversation. He calls the ambulance and the ambulance comes and ministers to the man and Jamie goes on they've exchanged names and numbers later the man contacts Jamie and says I was on my way over that ledge until you said are you okay my wife and I are going to have a baby and we're going to name our baby after you and Jamie knows that his willingness to say yes to this nudge to reach out was the power of the Almighty stepping in to make a difference. We need to walk around ready to step in. But we also need to walk around knowing what we have. Peter, James, and John come down the mountain. They have seen the transformation of their teacher into okay Messiah but this Messiah is so much more than just somebody who's going to come and be a political ruler this Messiah is the one who's going to come and go to the cross die for us die that we might be made whole raise again third day we know all this we know this. It's up to us to 
Let this permeate us so that it can lead us. This past week, we were doing our Tuesday prayer. And by the way, if you haven't put a prayer request in, let us know. Because we want to pray for you. And that's one of the ministries we do as a church. We pray for each other and we pray for friends near and far. We were praying in here over our prayer list and we saw the face of somebody come to the window. And so I left the team praying and went to the door. And this woman who was homeless, and as we had a conversation, she'd been homeless for four years. It's rough on the street. We talked about things. I was pointing her towards resources and whatnot, you know, all the appropriate recommendations. And we were standing there, and she was about to leave, and I realized I hadn't introduced myself. Mind you, I'm trying to say, okay, Lord, what is it that you need me to do in this situation? How do I be faithful? And I held out my hand. She'd already talked about how rough her hands were and how, you know, she can't get them clean. They were pretty beat up. Mine looked pretty pristine compared to hers. But I reached out my hand and said, my name's Riley. She at first, it's almost like she couldn't believe I was willing to touch her. Are you sure? And I've had that from folks who were homeless before. It's like, no one touches me. Is it okay? Well, and she reached her hand up, and all we did was shake hands. As soon as she touched my hand, tears started flowing. And I started praying for her. And I could feel the Lord's presence. And it reminded me that that is what he wants us to do. He wants us to connect with one another in him, with him, through him, by him, for him. What I thought was going to be a short encounter ended up being a longer conversation. Soup, coffee. There was no money in my wallet, so I couldn't even offer anything which was probably a good thing because that would have been a distraction because it was the encounter that was important. The disciples are talking and debating with religious folks about whether it's okay or how you might heal or can you heal this boy and the father and the son are just suffering. How long? How long? What they needed what we need, what those around us need, is a willingness to say, by the power and grace and love of the Almighty, here is love, here is hope, here is wholeness, and pray. Friends, we are that people of God who have been redeemed he says, the Lord says in our passage in Isaiah, I am the one. Can anyone else do what you have seen me do? It's not up for debate. There is no need to prove the Almighty. He doesn't ask us to prove Him. He doesn't ask us to win a theological argument. He wants us to let this truth of who He is so fill us and transform us that he shows through every time we show up. This word, transfigured, so Mark's real intentional. Matthew and Luke also, this word, uh, transfigured, is the exact same word in the Greek that Paul uses in Romans when he says we should be transformed by the renewal of our minds. So this transfiguring that Jesus does, where he's bright as lightning, and you see his kingdom glory on the mountaintop, we actually are called to be transfigured, transformed, made new. 
by that same power. And when it's all said and done, that power goes forth to accomplish what God intended to accomplish, which is different than what I want. It's different than what Peter wanted. It's different than what the religious leaders wanted. But as we get connected, he will lead us. He will lead us. Lord, thank you. As we get ready for communion, thank you. Continue to speak to our hearts that we follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on up. Lead us in this next song, I See a Victory. We walk in victory, no matter our circumstance, because Christ is in us. Falls out on prevail. Cause the God I know knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. My God will never fail. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Wages he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how this story ends. I know, I know.
but it starts at the cross. We know how the story ends. The disciples didn't yet understand. Jesus had only just begun telling them that the Son of Man would have to suffer and die, and on the third day he rose again. They resisted that. In some ways, we still resist this. We don't want the cross to be part of the spiritual truth of who we are in Christ. But the cross was essential. It is the heart of the new covenant. On the night which Jesus gave himself up for us, with his friends, the disciples, he sat at table and he took the bread. And it was customary. The bread was broken on the table. It was to be shared and eaten. And he gave it to his disciples, his friends, thinking of us even then. This is my body, which is given for you. That lamb that was sacrificed to protect the Israelites in Egypt that they had been acknowledging for generations. The Passover lamb was him. The same way he took the cup, gave thanks, offered it to them. This is my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is a new cup. As often as you drink, from this cup and eat of this bread, do it in remembrance of me and of these mighty acts with thanksgiving. So friends, as we partake of this, whether you're here in the sanctuary, in the patio, or at home, we do this in remembrance of Christ. And because of this, we have everlasting life, we have hope, we have purpose, we have the strength to endure, the power to transform, not just ourselves, but to be that influence on others. The body and blood of Christ given for you. And Lord, you gave yourself for us. We ask that you use us as we give ourselves back to you for your purpose. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hope is built on nothing less. Jesus' blood invites your stands. I dare not trust the sweetest brain. Holy trust in Jesus' name, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love.
Just in his heart, just this alone. Because of what the Lord has done for us. And the truth of what Isaiah declared centuries before Christ is ours this day. This is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who formed you, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Lord, we thank you that we are yours. We thank you that you bought us and named us and claimed us and set us on a path of your righteousness that we might be your instruments of love in this world. We give you ourselves this day out of sheer gratitude. Bless you, friends. The Lord be with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.